Hello, my name is Glenn Laverack, and this presentation is titled Health Promotion in Disease Outbreaks and Health Emergencies. It's based on the book of the same title, and the slide in front of you shows the front page of this book, which covers how to collect and analyze data during a disease outbreak, how to engage with communities, how to conduct health communication and risk communication, how to empower communities so that they can take more control, for example, in self-managed quarantines, how to work with the military and the police, how to deal with rumors, and how to deal with events in uh, after the uh, outbreak occurs. There is a chapter exclusively on Ebola, but there is also a chapter on person-to-person -person transmission, for example, the coronavirus, uh, and there's also a chapter specifically for vector-to-person transmission, for example, Zika, covering a number of infectious diseases. There's also a paper which is entitled Health Promotion in Disease Outbreaks, which highlights the main points of the book, which I've attached as part of this presentation. So let's make a start. In slide one, I talk about Disease X, a term which was put together by the World Health Organization to describe a hypothetical unknown pathogen in the future that could cause the next global health threat. And in fact, in 2020, the coronavirus outbreak was seen to meet all these requirements and was identified as the first disease X. In 2018, WHO created a shortlist of blueprint priority diseases which it felt warranted further research and development because these, this list of diseases had the potential for future global threats, health threats. And you can see in that list, uh, in slide number one, number four, it talks about MERS, uh, coronavirus, and SARS. I want to talk to you about the key challenges in the Ebola response, which I was involved with as a community engagement and communication advisor to the United Nations. But I feel that many of the challenges and the lessons that we learned during the Ebola outbreak could be applied in terms of health promotion to many other types of outbreaks. So I'd, I want to cover Ebola, but at the same time, I'm going to refer to how that refers to the current outbreak of coronavirus. If we look at the slide on the map of Sierra Leone, you can see that the three affected countries for Ebola in West Africa were interconnected with borders, Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone. Ebola started in, remote, in a remote rural area uh, with a transmission from an animal to a human, and then the disease spread by humans traveling along the artery of transportation routes into the cities where it then began to escalate and spread to other countries and other cities. With the coronavirus, of course, it started in a city, in a new city, and it spread via transportation routes, international, transport, international transportation routes, very quickly to other countries and to other cities, and then out to more, to more rural uh, contexts. Slide two talks about the different communication approaches that were used during the Ebola outbreak. Uh, this depended on the, largely on the agency support that was given to each country. Sierra Leone, for example, received a lot of support from UK-based agencies, and it followed a communication for development approach and an evidence-based approach using messaging, nuanced messaging, and the mass media. Liberia, which had more of an American support, used social behavior change communication uh, model as um, de developed by John Hopkins. And Guinea, which had a lot of support from, from Francophone countries, um, used a community committee where communities had committees of people to organize people through a network, and then this was supported by national radio. Uh, messaging through national radio and with the coronavirus we can also see that each country has not followed a systematic approach uh, used by everyone but it's developed its own approach based on the socio-political uh, 
cultural, economic, and uh, even the uh, historical context of the country. And in future, when we look at how we can work in communication and disease outbreaks in health promotion, we have to consider the social, cultural, the political, the economic, the historical context of that country and see which approach best fits the circumstances at that time in that country. Because with any disease outbreak, we are dealing with complex social processes very often. These are deep-seated traditional practices, whether that's about how we socialize together in groups or how we bury our dead. These are deep-seated practices that we have to try to at least temporarily change to, to prevent the spread of the disease. This means that individual, family and community involvement is essential and that people must be involved in self-managing and controlling the spread of the disease. Governments must give them the support they need to do this. Community-led quarantines, for example, with the Ebola outbreak and the community-led Ebola response, which I talk about in the book, which was used effectively in Sierra Leone, are two good examples of how we can work with communities uh, to help the spread of the disease. In slide three, I talk about the best practice for community engagement in a disease outbreak. This was put together by a number of people based on our experiences in the Ebola and in other disease outbreaks. And I provide a flow diagram of a step-by-step -step process on what, not, what needs to be done to engage with community. When we start, we very much need to look at some key questions, such as who is the community that we're trying to work with? Who are the stakeholders that we're trying to work with? What is the working definition we're going to use of community engagement so everyone can understand what we're trying to achieve? We need to connect with stakeholders, have meetings with leaders and with um, local representatives. We need to identify what our key communication messages are, the technical communication messages, but we also need to identify the needs of the community. And we can do this through focus groups or participatory methods so that with the needs and the communication messages, we can then inform the wider community about the purpose of the intervention to control the spread of the disease. If we want to work with communities, we need to strengthen their capacity through developing skills and knowledge and competencies. And we also need to enable communities to work with different agencies through collaborations and partnerships with non-government, with government, with the UN, and with one another. Communities working together to form partnerships. And finally, we need to monitor, constantly monitor and evaluate what's going on and provide this as feedback into the process of engagement in case it needs to be changed. It's important to think about what in this whole process of collecting information, needs assessments, identifying how we're moving forward, the role of anthropology. And with the Ebola outbreak, anthropological insights provided, provided a significant contribution at the beginning of the outbreak because we were able to look at experiences from Central Africa around human behavior and use that as part of our program planning. But it was observed that an ongoing anthropological work in West Africa, and there were a lot of anthropologists working in West Africa quite independently, not much of this work was used for the ongoing programs. And this was largely because program managers, people that were working on the ground, found it difficult to translate anthropological findings into practical recommendations that they could apply to their programs. The data that they were getting from anthropologists was in-depth, thick, um, dense, uh, you know, based on long-term inputs. What program managers needed really was quick and dirty information that they could act on immediately and uh, which did not take too much time to collect. So rather than a slow science approach of anthropology, the quick and dirty approach of social science was much more, was much more widely used in the Apollo outbreak. And this might be the case with many outbreaks where time is the real enemy. We have to get the information we need together as quickly as possible. And we have to translate this. We need people that are able to translate these findings, these social science findings, these anthropological science findings into practical recommendations for program implementation. Community resistance in slide five is important because 
Although people do not resist change, they do resist being changed, for example, by top-down interventions such as quarantines and lockdowns. We found in the Ebola outbreak that non-compliant or resistant behavior was a cycle, really, of unwillingness of people to change traditional practices, but also their feelings were made worse by experiences of receiving post-service delivery and a weak information, weak information flow from the agencies that were working in the uh, Ebola uh, program. So, for example, in, uh, in West Africa, uh, people that had died or suspected to have died of Ebola were taken away from people's uh, houses or communities, and uh, they were never given any information about what happened to these people. And this created rumors, but it also created resistance for people not to report others that were sick uh, and not to cooperate with authorities. It created mistrust and fear, and it created uh, resistance to cooperate at an individual and at a community level. In fact, the resistance over time did not get less. It, in fact, got more intensive as people had more and more experiences of poor service delivery um, or their, their experience with interaction with agencies and health services was, uh, was seen not to be good. It is possible to map it, and we did try to map it in West Africa. Uh, we can map it in terms of a city or in terms of a region so that we can see where the hotspots of resistance are, and then we can try to negotiate and try to resolve these problems. I think what the key point here is in slide six is that we need to be careful how we work with communities. It's not necessarily about building trust, but it's about building respect. And a phased approach is an approach that we carefully considered, where we used a three-color code scheme, a red, an amber, and a green phase, to indicate if a community was prepared to cooperate or was ready to cooperate. The red phase, for example, indicated that the community had not been engaged, that people there were resistant or were not willing to cooperate at that stage with authorities, and therefore, a red face community uh, or neighborhood in a city, for example, was not to be approached by outside agencies. An amber phase indicated that community representatives had been engaged, had, been, uh, had, had met with other agencies, and had expressed a willingness to work with other agencies. And it was not until we reached the green phase, which indicated that community representatives had agreed to allow people to come into their community or to come into their neighborhood and to work with them to try to mitigate the, uh, the circumstances around Ebola uh, that people were allowed to go, come and go with, within that neighborhood or within that community. So using a simple approach such as this, and the next slide gives it, uh, but in a little bit more detail, um, is a good way that everyone, communities and different agencies, even from speaking different languages, can use and better understand about if they should or when they should engage with a community. That brings me on to slide seven, which talks about addressing rumors. There was a continuous flow of rumors with the Ebola outbreak, as there has been a continuous flow of rumors coming out of uh, the coronavirus outbreak, false information about what people can do and what they can't do during a quarantine, for example, um, what government interventions were trying to achieve in, in um, the Ebola outbreak. There was a rumor that uh, immunization programs, which were ongoing at the same time as the Ebola outbreak, were purposefully spreading the disease. And therefore, for example, the, the, the vaccination program for measles, for example, was very much uh, affected and, and had to, at one point had to be stopped because people that were going into communities to give vaccination found that there were no children available. Parents would take their children away from those communities. In fact, those communities sometimes were very hostile towards people coming in uh, to do things like vaccination. And this was as a result of mistrust and fear, poor information uh, that was leading to an ex ex escalation of rumors. In the book, I devote um, a chapter to talking about how we can identify rumors, investigate where the rumors are coming from, and how we can correct or mitigate these rumors, either through a network of people 
who are working at the community level and therefore able to monitor the rumors and feed them back to a central source, or through analyzing data in the media uh, textually and then trying to counter these rumors with correct information. It's a specialist area, but it's a very important area which has to be dealt with in any disease outbreak. In slide eight, I talk about a specific context uh, which is relevant to all infectious disease outbreaks, particularly person-to-person -person, uh, transmission, and that is in urban, densely populated urban or slum areas. In West Africa, there were very large areas of slum housing in which people lived in very close proximity, in pro close proximity to one another, densely populated, poor sanitation, poor water supply, poor access to health care. Access into and out of these communities is very difficult because the streets um, or the alleys are very narrow. Uh, so going in to, for example, to remove somebody that has died or to give somebody health care or to take for, for, for contact tracing is extremely difficult. But also, um, these communities are often hostile towards um, government authorities or to even to outside agencies. They themselves may be living there illegally and they don't want people coming in. Um, and often for the protection of the health workers going into these areas, it was necessary to bring the police or to negotiate with the local leaders and local administration. Certainly the rural-based process for community engagement that was being used generally in the countries could not be applied to this context. This is a specific and a unique context and we do not yet have at this stage a good community engagement and communication strategy. But this context which exists in many countries around the world uh, is an explosive situation in which an infectious disease such as Ebola or the coronavirus could explode in terms of the infection rates, the reproduction rates in the community. And therefore it's something which is really a question of priority and needs to be dealt with as soon as possible. We also have to consider that when we're working in difficult areas like this or in other areas in cities or in, in areas of a country, Certain zones may be off limits because of uh, the activities of gangs uh, or, um, terror or areas where we have militant groups and therefore we ourselves have to work with the military or work with police and we need clear guidelines about in public health how we can work more effectively in terms of the public perception of what we're trying to achieve so that we don't create uh, resistance and that we don't re create active um, protests which did happen in West Africa uh, when police and army and the army was involved in trying to remove uh, um, bodies that had uh, people from people that had died from Ebola so we have to be sensitive and respectful about people and we need to think about carefully how we can work in these very densely populated areas as soon as possible we have to consider this in slide number nine I show, uh, or in the next slide, I show a, a paper called Blacker Than Black, which a copy is being uh, provided, which is outlines the key issues around uh, working in slum communities and puts forward a solution that might be thought, you might think about uh, how the United Nations and international agencies can work together to put together a set of guidelines. So I, I encourage you to read that paper it's a short paper to read that paper as part of this presentation. In slide nine, I talk about cross-border issues. In the Ebola outbreak, this was important because the disease was spread from person to person uh, through close contact. And even though the borders were closed officially and flights were stopped and the roads were blocked, people were still moving. These borders were porous. You know, for many centuries, people, uh, the communities have become interwoven through language and ethnicity and marriage and traditions and economy and people were still traveling between countries uh, by foot or by bicycle so it's very difficult to stop cross-border movements um, because of economy or because of family for example and therefore we need to have a systematic approach that we can use across these very um, often very long borders 
sometimes in quite remote areas. Um, policing and the military were tried um, in West Africa, but it was not very successful. At the time, it was thought that a more successful approach would be to engage with local communities that lived along these borders and through which people traveled uh, with local leaders so that they could be a community managed approach so that people themselves living in the communities could monitor and manage the flow of people coming in and out. After all, they would know who is local and who is not local um, and they could manage uh, and monitor the flow of people uh, to try and slow down or prevent the spread of the disease. So again here, community involvement was very important. Finally, in slide 10, I talk about what we need to do in the future for health promotion and disease outbreaks. Essentially, this means working together. It means thinking outside of the public health box. We need to think about creative partnerships with community, with uh, uh, non-government organizations, with community-based organizations that often provide a bridge between government interventions and people living uh, in community. Community-based organizations can uh, form a network through which we can deliver services and resources and information if it is strong and if it exists. Where it does not exist or where it is not strong or well coordinated, as was the case in West Africa uh, at the beginning of the Ebola outbreak and is the case in many countries around the world, then it should be government that should look at building the capacity of the network of community-based organizations so that we can build more creative partnerships with community. But this is a contested area and it needs to be thought about carefully about whose responsibility it is to strengthen community-based organizations so that we can work with them um, around the spread, to, to, to engage with community to help uh, prevent the spread of the disease. We also need to think at the governmental level that we need to work intersectorally. An infectious disease is not just about the public health or the health department, it's about education, it's about transport, it's about employment, and we need to be able to engage intersectorially. And some countries do have intersectoral teams for um, the um, control of infectious diseases, but we need to think about this more systematically across all countries, because diseases such as coronavirus spread very quickly um, across many countries, and therefore we need to have a systematic approach that can be put into place before it happens, but certainly when it happens, there is a procedure that can be followed. Certainly we need creative, or we need to create, sorry, supportive policy and, and, and an enforcement environment. For example, we know that um, uh, the Ebola and probably also coronavirus came from uh, an animal source, perhaps from a, a market for, as a food source for people. Um, MERS, for example, which uh, can be transmitted from um, an animal source to people. Uh, also in markets, potentially possibly also in slaughterhouses. These, if we have a policy for hygiene and for management of these sorts of facilities, we also need to have proper enforcement in countries. It's about good public health, it's about good environmental health, it's about government commitment to ensure that we have proper hygiene and enforcement of regulations uh, around these issues to prevent this spread from, from animal to human in terms of uh, infectious diseases. But we also need to have good community engagement. We need to have good c community cooperation because even if we have markets which are properly designed and which have hygiene facilities, unless, they're, unless it's well enforced, unless it's enforced well and we do have cooperation from people to use them rather than using other sources to sell their products, um, then we're still going to have a spread of the disease. So we will always need to have proper community involvement in any disease outbreak. And that can only be done through proper engagement and through working through a network of community-based organizations. And these need to be in place. We need to be able to map these and understand how these function and how they can be resourced and how they can be, how we can work with them before a disease outbreak. That's the presentation. I also provide at the end of this um, presentation uh, a slide, um, which is an exercise, which is optional. It's, 
it's for you as an individual or in a small group to consider the, the case study that is, the short case study that is provided and background, further background information about this situation is provided in the paper that I have attached um, about um, disease outbreaks, in, uh, specifically sorry about the Ebola disease outbreak by myself and someone called Emma Manacor. Essentially, this is taken from experience in Sierra Leone where, um, and in Liberia, where it was found that knowledge levels about the modes of transmission and the symptoms of Ebola were very high when, we, when CAP studies, when knowledge, attitude and practice studies were carried out, as high as 90% or more. And this showed that the communication strategies were working to spread information, but we know that information, one-way directional information is not sufficient. There needs to be an engagement with people and a discussion about the issues that they face, the problems that they face, to talk about the solutions that they can overcome, the solutions that they can use to overcome so that they can you know, reduce their contact with people, so that they can have access to soap, so they can have access to, um, uh, to healthcare facilities so that they're willing to report somebody that's sick or willing to give information about contacts. So we need that person to face and that face-to-face -face communication often at a household level in this case in, in West Africa. But it was found when this was evaluated that the quality uh, was very variable. The quality of the and the coverage of the face-to-face -face communication varied. Sometimes it was extremely weak and it was found that many of the communicators you know who were being temporarily involved without very much training were fearful of, of their own circumstances uh, of, of uh, catching the disease and did not want to go into households did not want to talk to householders and sometimes they would just leave a leaflet at the door without any contact so i want you to think about this problem i want you to think about how you would yourself try to improve this situation how would you improve the quality uh, and the coverage of face-to-face -face communication in a disease outbreak where people that are coming into contact with members of the public are at risk. Uh, what knowledge resources do you provide and how and to whom would you give these knowledge resources and skills? Refer to the paper that uh, is attached to this presentation and then I suggest that you come back together as a group and. Um, and talk about or talk about with your with the facilitator talk about your conclusions about how you could improve this situation thank you very much uh, that's the end of the presentation and uh, i hope it's useful